Global Cannabis Integrated Pest Management Review 2019 Part 2, Cannabis Ecology and Pest Host Relationships. Like many crop species, cannabis is cultivated in numerous locations and has been for millennia. Throughout that time, artificial selection by humans towards various traits changed the physiology of cannabis and, ostensibly, movement of populations that have established biogeographic symbioses and susceptibilities with various organisms may have changed the physiological dynamics of such populations, especially in radically different ecological zones. Although early cultivators across Eurasia and neighboring areas did not necessarily understand the ramifications, population mixing between cultivated populations of slightly and radically different environments may have unintentionally introduced some of the first anthropologically associated beneficial microbes, as well as endophytes and pests, at least to new areas. Although not always the case, there is a tendency towards the origins of a family or species being associated with a greater diversity of that group or organisms associated with that group. Based on the current understanding of cannabaceae development in general, and cannabis in particular, long-established symbiotic organisms, pests, as well as their natural enemies, might be more prevalent in Central Asia. But depending on how quickly cannabis traveled from its point of speciation pre-domestication, the whole of Eurasia may be generally more equal in influence, or highly stratified based on distribution patterns, since the Berdigalian age of the Neogene period. Phytochoria are areas with similar proportions of plant species, and can be ecologically similar, and have general environmental traits which can inform the natural, biotic, and abiotic influences existing therein. Assuming a central or southern Asian origin, cannabis developed around the alpine tundra biome in the East Asiatic Phytochorian, but near and expanding into the irano terranian Circumboreal, Mediterranean, Sudano-Zambesian, Indian, and Indochinese Phytochoria. The first four phytochoria overlap with the wider Palearctic ecozone, where organisms of the area are thought to have evolved isolated from the southern Indomalaya and Afrotropic ecozones. In this approximate immediate developmental ecozone, there are smaller ecoregions in which cannabis developed. Using the basal, low, middle, and high haplogroups as a proxy, For recent cannabis development in the past 2.5 million years, several ecoregions have been recently influential, like the southern bushlands, as well as broadleafed and coniferous forests, making up much of the scotoperiod-sensitive low haplogroups territory. Low and middle haplogroup populations mix, close to 30 degrees north latitude, where there is more meadow, coniferous and broadleafed forests, in denser intensities, such as the southeast Tibet shrub and meadows. The scotoperiod-insensitive middle haplogroup plants were found in desert and alpine forests in the west, like the Karakoram West Tibetan Plateau Alpine Steppe and subalpine conifer forests of the Hungduan Mountains, and near the temperate conifer forests of the Chonglai Minshan Mountains. They were found more centrally and easternly in areas dominated by meadows and forests, as well as the northwestern and eastern Himalayan alpine shrub and meadows. The North Tibetan Plateau Kunlun Mountains alpine desert, and moving north into more coniferous and broadleafed forests. According to the haplogroup research, the hemp cultivars Futura 75, Kampolti, Yunma Chi, Jinma Yi, as well as the cultivars Afghanica, Blanche, Dame, and Purple Kush, were all associated with high haplogroup scotoperiod insensitive populations, with much of this population sampled near or in the Mongolian Manchurian grasslands past the 40 degrees north latitude mark. Indubitably, 
Since early domestication, cannabis cultivation has dealt with pests, and these regions may hold valuable references for understanding primitive pest management and breeding praxis. Stretching from 12,000 to 30,000 or so years ago in the Tarantian age of the Pleistocene. Accessing resources and information that expound on common agricultural pests and their hosts in these and modern areas is crucial in preparation for and continual situational awareness of cannabis pests. The origins of cannabis pests shared commonly with other crop pests are not all known confidently, nor exhaustively, but their origin range is pan-global, including the rice root aphid from Eastern Asia, such as the Japanese archipelago, spotted lanternfly and silverleaf whitefly in Central and Southeast Asia, and two-spotted spider mite from the South American and African neotropics, as well as many microbial pathogens, the origins of which are more cryptic and sometimes cosmopolitan. The first of the Cannabaceae developed relatively recently, considering the evolutionary coevolution of plants, arthropods, bacteria, and fungi, and cannabis even more so, with the biogeography of the Burdigalian Age closely resembling the Tarantian Age biogeographically. Pests, biocontrols, mutualistic microbes, and the cannabis populations adapted to them may exist in Central and Southeastern Eurasia, expanding out over millions of years and many environmental changes throughout various ecotones, boundary areas of ecological interaction between biomes. Land plants in general have a very fundamental, intimate, and long-standing relationship with bacteria and fungi. Over much longer time scales, the evolution of green land plants has been shaped by defense and competition. It can also be said that natural selection pressures like these have existed since before their algal ancestors derived energy from light, processed by chloroplasts since before algal chloroplasts developed from their cyanobacterial symbionts that developed hundreds of millions of years ago. Arthropods, too, have played a significant role in the evolution of plants, particularly land plants, representing a unique selection pressure for all early terrestrial life, with many of the extant lineages which encompass some of the most pestiferous species having co-developed with flowering plants intimately. The foundation of land plant physiology, particularly immune and defense-related aspects of physiology, is related to these ancient interactions, and since landfall represents an arms race across several hundred million years, with composite organisms like various lichens, corals, and those of land plants developing very early. Mutualism and parasitism are two ends of an evolutionary lifestyle spectrum, that is, symbiosis, and transition between which can be rapid and capricious. Some of these ancient lineages of microbes may positively affect cannabis growth by competing with pathogenic microbes for space and resources, producing compounds that stimulate certain aspects of growth or immune response, facilitate the acquisition of resources, and even infect pest organisms. Others can act in a symbiotic fashion in some contexts, but change to a commensalic or even parasitic relationship in other contexts, complicating their use and cultivation. Two isolates from the same species, or two virtually morphological and even genetically identical species from the same genus, can have radically different lifestyles. Often, both symbionts and pathogens can exist in the same taxonomic group, closely related, utilizing the same or similar genetic and chemical pathways to colonize a host plant. For these and other reasons, various plant lineages have gained and lost the ability to interact with microbes generally or specifically as a response to such changes. One of the most fundamental plant symbioses exists between plants and fungi. Fungal symbioses are thought to have existed since at least the first land plants more than 450 million years ago in the Silurian period, according to some estimates, and possibly earlier in others. The fossil organism discovered in 2019 referred to as Orospera giraldae 
has been described as having a fungal affinity and may have existed on land as early as one billion years ago, during the Tonian period in what is now the North American continent, predating other ancient land fungi such as Prototaxides and Nematoschidum, thought to have developed in the Silurian period, through a horizontal gene transfer event between ancient cyanobacteria and the two billion year old fungal group Glomeromycota, before the orders Diversispirales and Glomerales diverged, an enzyme associated with bacteria and possibly important for symbiosis called ribonuclease 3 was found in Rhizoglomus irregulare. Chloroplasts, the organs and plant cells that are responsible for photosynthesis, are thought to be derived from endosymbiotic cyanobacteria. Endocyanosis, symbiosis between mycorrhizal fungi and cyanobacteria, has been documented between a highly unique and older member of Glomeromycota, Geosiphon piriformis, and the cyanobacteria Nostoc punctiforme. Considering Glomeromycota is among the oldest and most gregarious group of plant symbiotic fungi, this context implies early mycorrhizal fungus cyanobacteria symbioses may have predated fungal plant symbioses, in turn, potentially affecting early plant development fundamentally, like in the incorporation of symbiotic cyanobacteria, which would become chloroplasts. At the very least, close association between early bacterial, fungal, and land plant life existed and the most basal land plants developed within this biogeographic ecological context. There are approximately 5,000 fungal species by some estimations that form root colonizing symbioses, of which there are seven types commonly articulated. There are the endomycorrhizal fungi, of which there are the arbuscular, orchid, ericoid, and monotropid which all developed at different times and among different lineages of Ericaceae and Orchidaceae plant families. The 2200 million year old fungal division, Glomeromycota, comprises the Arbuscular Mycorrhiza. The Ascomycotal order Hilotiales encompasses most of the Ericoid Mycorrhiza, and various Basidiomycota, but especially Ceratobasidium, which encompasses Rhizoctania, encompass the orchid mycorrhiza as well as the final monotropid mycorrhiza, which colonize and are obligatory for the development of the monotropidae, a subfamily of the Ericaceae. There are also the ectomycorrhizal fungi, which include the arbutoid mycorrhiza, which also associate with members of Ericaceae. Additionally, there are the ectendomycorrhizal fungi, primarily genus Wilcoxina, which associate with Pinus, Picea, and Lyric species of plants. Some research points out that this somewhat arbitrary morphotype naming schema unintentionally hides the actual morphological diversity of mycorrhiza and evolution of such relationships, and it is possible these designations will change over time. Despite the general plant-positive nature of so many mycorrhizal relationships, it might be argued that the nature by which orchid, ericoid, and monotropid mycorrhizal relationships developed could be considered detrimental to the plant partner, and not necessarily synergistic, at least indirectly. These plant groups that rely on such symbioses have a highly reduced morphology and obligate dependence on resources supplied by the mycorrhiza makes them incapable of surviving without them. Such a dependence could be a liability if antimicrobial and especially fungicidal agents, natural or artificial, make contact with them. But this association may have allowed these plants to survive in conditions where other plants were disadvantaged, as it is common for plants to rely on symbioses to colonize more extreme environments. In some cases, such as with Funeliformis mossiae, formerly Glomus mossiae, 
an arbuscular mycorrhizal fungus commonly available commercially, plant immune systems can be facilitated or impaired by such presence in particular infestation contexts, making precise relationship research important. Mycorrhiza-induced susceptibility is a detrimental status that can occur in plants whereby viruses may be facilitated by the presence of a mycorrhizal relationship due to physiological changes that can occur therein, like those to hormonal regulation and phosphate nutrition, where timing of colonization and infection, as well as plant age, are integral factors. Rhizophagus irregularis, formerly Glomus intraradices, has been documented to colonize tomato, potato, and tobacco, with such colonization associated with both positive effects, mycorrhizal-induced resistance, as well as negative effects related to viral infection, such as more severe symptoms and an increased viral load. Endophytic insect pathogenic fungi are able to transfer metabolites and nutrients from insect hosts into different plant species. Species of the insect pathogens Metarhesium and Bouveria are able to infect soil insects and subsequently transfer insect-derived nitrogen to plants, as well as exist in plants endophytically, and their presence in plant tissue has been correlated with repellent and mycosizing effects against herbivorous pests. For some fungi, these traits that were adapted for one lifestyle became exaptated or made useful in another context due to an ancestry of animal-based associations called symbiotic lifestyle switching. Such fungi, and these two genera in particular, are generalist endophytes and have been found to colonize many plant species endophytically. Metarhesium is from the fungal family Clavicipitaceae, in order Hypocreales, the family having existed for at least 115 million years by some recent estimates, forming extremely close mutualistic and parasitic relationships with the grasses, family Poaceae, in the Aptian age of the Cretaceous period, when the South American, Antarctic, and Australian continents were joined. Grasses, in general, are estimated to have developed around the Baremian age of the Cretaceous period. Metarhesium and its close relatives are known as symbionts of grasses and while the earliest species in order Hypocreales derived their nutrition from plants, species shifted abruptly to fungal and animal-based nutrition over time, and the common ancestor of the Clavicipitaceae grass symbionts was a pathogen of animals, most likely arthropods. Having this evolutionary history, Metarhesium produced compounds like destructins, which are highly toxic to arthropods, and the production of such metabolites make it a useful symbiont and biocontrol agent. Similarly, Bouveria species of the family Corycipitaceae produce arthropodicidal compounds like Bouvericin, but as of 2013, according to the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants, Bouveria might be better recognized as the asexual form of another very famous fungal genus, Cordyceps. Glomerella species of family Glomerellaceae constitute another group of fungal endophytes with symbiotic lifestyle switching, whereby various isolates can span the entirety of the mutualistic spectrum, with small changes in plant host and fungal genome playing a large role in whether the colonization will be beneficial or detrimental. It has been proposed in some research that the reason so many fungal endophytes are ubiquitous in the environment is because they can switch between multiple lifestyles and existing in some hosts non-pathogenically is beneficial because such plants represent reservoirs from which the organism can spread to plants that they can infect. In this way, a single species or closely related group can spread quickly to many biogeographic regions through long-distance dispersal and other avenues. The difference between antagonistic, benign, or neutral effects can more specifically depend on the nature of the host immune response and whether or not the fungus can defeat or attenuate it.
if elicited, other endophytic fungi confer resistances like Fusarium culmorum to the dune grass Lamus mollis, a necessary tolerance of saline soils in its habitat, and can be isolated in most tissue, including seed coats. Without this symbiotic relationship, the dune grass would not be able to tolerate the environment in which it has developed natively. This is referred to as habitat adapted symbiosis, wherein the symbiont is required by the host for habitat adaptation. To various degrees, such microbial mutualisms have benefited cannabis populations in their native territory, and understanding these interactions can lead to more efficacious implementation of those relationships. Taxonomically speaking, however, many fungal groups still require restructuring, so the names of various species and their placement at species, genus, family, and even order level are likely to change in the future, making accurate reference material integral for cultivators. Ultimately, many fungi in general, but particularly endophytes, display a high degree of ecological and phenotypic plasticity, which has contributed to vast misinterpretations relating to classification and ecological function. Many species are too complex ecologically to be accurately designated simply as pathogenic or beneficial, and confirming commensalic relationships can be challenging, particularly without genetic or observational documentation. Adding to the complexity, fungal and other symbionts may harbor their own pathogens and symbionts that affect their relationships with other organisms. The tropical panic grass, Dicanthelium lejuniosum, can only survive in the soil that is 38 degrees Celsius but when it hosts the endophyte Curvularia protuberata of family Pleosporaceae, infected with Curvularia thermal tolerance virus, it can survive in soil up to 65 degrees Celsius. Plants also developed around bacteria, with various relationships both detrimental and beneficial. Cyanobacteria became chloroplasts, but many bacteria were less influential. Symbioses are great boons and were foundational to land-plant life, but the mechanisms related to such relationships were and continue to be exploited. In research concerning liverworts, one of the earliest divergent line of land plants, the plant pathogen Phytophthora palmivora was shown to exploit intracellular accommodations for filamentous microbes. Ostensibly, as long as symbioses have existed, so has the exploitation of such relationships using the same manner of interaction. Many pathogens and beneficial bacteria are species that are closely related and have similar physiological tolerances and traits, such as manipulation of the symbiotic relationship. Bacteria-plant interactions are also mediated by vectoring agents that developed in tandem, such as arthropods, like mites and insects currently. The first arthropods have been phylogenetically estimated to have originated in the Ediacaran period, 635 million years ago, with fossil evidence and certain groups arising later, around the Precambrian Cambrian boundary 542 million years ago, such as the trilobites. This later period follows what is thought to be the first extinction event, the end Ediacaran extinction when many Cambrian organisms developed rapidly and diversely, a time when the Earth was dominated by the Panthalassan Ocean, surrounding the supercontinent Rodinia. Though research from 2019 indicates that many insect lineages actually predate and did not succumb as severely as previously interpreted. Some recent research estimates that the first mites in groups Acariformes and Parasitiformes, as well as their relatives developed in the early Cambrian period, and the Hexapoda in the late Cambrian, whereas the basal insects of class Insecta developed about 100 million years later, in the middle of the Ordovician period. Owing to myriad vastness and diversity, the arthropod phylogeny has been a point of contention for many decades and 
fossil records of many of the earliest organisms is lacking. However, with current estimates, it is clear that such organisms co-evolved with some of the earliest land plants and have associated for the majority of land plant evolution. Several contemporary herbivorous arthropoda rely greatly on and have been influenced by the development of their food source as well as the hollow microbiome, that is, the entirety of all the genomes in an ecological unit called a biont. A biont can be the body of a human or a plant, a community of plants, or the entire earth. Backed by evolutionary research, there is a prevalent presumption that, for example, intracellular plant pathogenic bacteria transmitted by insect vectors evolved first as insect endosymbionts, only later becoming plant pathogens in a secondary capacity through evolutionary pressures. Gut bacterial and fungal microbiota are important for herbivory in many insects and developed after a mainly detrivorous insect lifestyle arose first. Phytoplasmas of the group Molecutes and Liberobacter in the group Alpha Proteobacteria comprise bacteria that are all ecologically specialized as arthropod vectored plant pathogens and many are virtually incurable agricultural pests, like the various hemp phytoplasmas documented across Eurasia and North America. Other examples of vector-borne bacterial plant pathogens include arthropod intracellular symbionts, such as Arsenophonus of the gamma proteobacteria, rickettsia of the alpha proteobacteria, and spiroplasma, which are also molecules. The microbes in these groups have had profound, fundamental effects on the development of arthropods. Both contemporary pests as well as their biocontrol agents used by cultivators. Their presence can, in various ways, benefit hosts, especially pests, by defending them from predation and processing food into necessary compounds as symbionts, or influence the sex of offspring turning an entire population into parthenogenetic, asexually reproducing females, for example. Some symbionts even have their own symbionts, or unique traits that greatly changes their dynamics with the host. Others are much less useful to their host in certain contexts, causing diseases opportunistically or reliably, such as with the actinobacteria Acaricomys phytoseuli, which causes non-responding syndrome in the specialist spider mite predator Phytocilius persimilis, one of the most commonly implemented and effective biocontrol agents of Tetranicus urticae, the two-spot spider mite, and others in the family Tetranicidae. Plant microbe arthropod dynamics being what they are, close association has created numerous complex interactions, many of which are undocumented or poorly understood, and the presence of such may cause incidental or egregious problems in various cultivation contexts. Bacteria that can process or fix diatomic nitrogen present in the atmosphere are part of a group of organisms called diazotrophs, and they closely associated with and benefited plants by making nitrogen more available. Over time, these bacterial symbioses sophisticated, Many plant symbiotic bacteria are collectively referred to as plant growth promoting bacteria. For their many observably beneficial effects, they can have on plant physiology. It has been posited in some research that the proteobacteria group, specifically Enterobacterales, Pseudomonadales, Xanthomonadales, Rhizobiales, Sphingomonadales, Burkholderales, Actinomycetales and Flavobacterales dominates the diversity of documented endophytes, with the Firmicutes and Actinobacteria comprising other commonly documented species. The Acetobacteria, Bacteroides, Plantomycetes, and Veromicrobia are also important, but less commonly documented. At the level of genera, Pseudomonas bacillus, Burkholderia, Stenotrophomonas, Micrococcus, Pantoea, 
and microbacterium compose commonly documented pathogens, endophytes, symbionts, and also rhizosphere inhabitants, leading some to purport that endophytes in the above-ground phylosphere may often also be common in the below-ground rhizosphere, perhaps so much that the former may be a subpopulation of the latter, more often than not, emphasizing extreme importance of the nexus at the plant-root-substrate-rhizosphere microbiome interface. It has, for example, been documented under experimental conditions that some microbes inoculated in substrate were found to have moved from root to foliar tissues and eventually into the guts of herbivorous caterpillars, lending credence to the perspective that soil microbiome dynamics can be far-reaching and affect organisms existing in the phylosphere, such as pests. Nitrogen-fixing bacterial symbiosis is rather old in land plants, approximately 100 million years old or so, ancestral to groups in the order Rosales, like the Eurosid clade 1. Though, considering current understanding, there may have been similar developments in extinct land plant populations prior. Nitrogen-fixing bacterial symbiosis requires the induction of root nodules in plants, which only occurs in the leguminosae and perisponia genus of Cannabaceae. Genes such as those associated with fungal symbioses like SMERC were integral for their initialization. Without such fungal symbiosis genes developing and acting in concert with other genes related to pollen tube formation and leg hemoglobin production, as well as their polyploid replication, nitrogen-fixing bacterial symbiosis, as it is understood, might not exist. Research regarding the starkly unique evolution of nitrogen-fixing rhizobial symbiosis in Perisponia andersonii and the legume Metacago truncatula found parallel loss in the same symbiosis genes, which challenges the view that nodulation symbioses evolved in parallel, raising the possibility that nodulation originated approximately 100 million years ago in a common ancestor of all nodulating plant species, but was subsequently lost in many descendant lineages. Since mutualism exists on a spectrum and many pathogens share common pathways of colonization, plants must be able to mediate ongoing relationships by either validating quality of the microbe using chemical communications as a proxy for suitability, or by attenuating lower quality symbionts post-colonization so that they do not receive as many resources from the host plant. These two examples are the partner choice and sanction strategies respectively, and are examples of two hypotheses about how symbioses between plants and nitrogen-fixing bacterial symbionts in particular function. Current and ancestral leguminosae benefited from several ancestral polyploid events that allowed for a range of relationship tendencies with such bacteria from highly promiscuous species that interlocute with a wide range of microbes to very specific symbioses like those well known between actinorhizal bacteria like Frankia and rhizobial bacteria like rhizobium. The cannabis bacteriome in general, and symbioses in particular, are not well known, but for Perisponia in the family, is there the only non-legume nodulation symbiosis documented currently? Such symbioses have been gained and lost over time, and many plant lineages related to leguminosae lost the ability seemingly completely in all or most extant species, which may speculatively inform their contextual importance to cannabis development and cultivation. Without specific research into these relationships, it is difficult to come to many demonstrable conclusions at this juncture in cannabis microbiome research. But speculatively, it may be possible that those symbioses were lost because they became more parasitic than mutualistic, a common development, and 
that many of the plant species that relied greatly and even obligatorily on such interactions, especially for fundamental necessities like surviving changes in environment or defense against herbivores, perished with the advent of newly pathogenic relationships. Some microbial communities may have been sensitive to the many fluctuations in the global environment over millions of years, but the composite nature of organisms, their reliance on the presence of food and shelter provided by biotic and abiotic sources, makes wide speculation impractical. In addition to endophytic bacteria, endohyphal bacteria, or bacteria that exist symbiotically in fungi, have been documented in cannabis, specifically the hemp cultivars Anka, CRS1, and Yvonne. Though better understood more recently, sophisticated understanding of the influences of endohyphal bacteria is lacking, and somewhat less so for endophytes generally, so their application for the promotion of plant growth is limited. These special bacteria are particularly important in that they influence the diversity of fungal endophytes, enhance their tolerance to stress, synthesize compounds vital for colonization of the plant, and regulate their fungal host's reproductive mechanisms. However, the endophytes documented in these three established cultivars of industrial hemp have been documented to solubilize inorganic phosphate and iron, produce hydrogen cyanide and several plant hormones, such as indole acetic acid. Pseudomonas fulva and Pseudomonas orientalis were particularly effective at producing large amounts of siderophores and phosphatase, which would increase the availability of iron and phosphate in the soil respectively. Indole acetic acid is an auxin, and among other things, is important for defense pathway signaling and may help prime plants against certain stressors. For cannabis cultivation, the sampling, research, and implementation of known beneficial microbes specifically associated with cannabis and both its native wild and cultivated biomes should be targeted in order to increase effectiveness where appropriate. Additionally, there are also microbes that have beneficial effects in the cultivation of cannabis despite not closely associating with the plant's tissues directly, such as free-living microbes that may alter the intimate area influenced by root exudates called the rhizosphere, and the surface of the roots, the rhizoplane, as well as the entire above-ground portion of the plant, the phylosphere, especially the surface of the leaves, the phyloplane. Pseudomonas cannabina is a pathogen formerly circumscribed as a special Pseudomonas syringae pathogen variety. It has itself two pathovars, Pseudomonas cannabina pathovar cannabina and Pseudomonas cannabina pathovar elisalensis. The former is only documented on cannabis, with cultures known from Hungary and Yugoslavia cannabis hosts, but the latter is documented on oats, Avena sativa, and various Brassicaceae. Like Aruca vesicaria, arugula, the Italica, Botrytis, and Gemifera cultivar groups of Brassica oleraceae, specifically broccoli, cauliflower, romanesca, and Brussels sprouts, respectively, as well as Raphanus raffinistrum, subspecies sativus, the cultivated radish, and Brassica napis, variety Napobrassica. Rutabaga. Many of the aforementioned bacterial and fungal phyla have been found to exist prodigiously as mutualistic microbes or parasitic pathogens, both inside and outside plant tissue, as well as at the nexus between plants and soil, as both have species that can serve dual ecological roles as detrivores with mainly bacterial phyla like the Firmicutes and Proteobacteria existing in decaying plant tissues and derivatives, like in compost. Many of the aforementioned bacterial and fungal groups contain important detrivores and symbionts and pathogens, some of which are the same species in the same genus or closely related genera in the same family, 
with many of the same physiological resistances to environmental stressors, sharing close to the exact same genetic makeup. It should be noted that, even with multiple lifestyle adaptations, some pathogens or mutualists may skew towards some over others, potentially losing these similar physiological resistances when it fails to make the organism less fit. For example, Erwinia carotivora, subspecies carotivora, Xanthomonas campestris, pathovar vesicatoria, and Pseudomonas syringae, pathovar syringae, are closely related to beneficial bacteria but in some research did not survive aerated compost kept above 50 degrees Celsius past 15 hours and 15 minutes at 70 degrees Celsius. Because of these ecologically complex microbes, discriminating between identical pathogenic and beneficial populations is an arduous and daunting but necessary task for both plants as well as cultivators. No matter their species, the intimate genetic chemical communication and modulation between one or multiple plant symbionts that precedes endophytic symbiosis means that in natural and cultivated contexts, the introduction of microbes into the microbiome of a plant requires that microbes have the traits necessary for such interaction and that the environment is suitable for enough time that physiological benefit manifests. Particularly in the realm of cannabis cultivation, much like it is for other agricultural crops, such complex dynamics are not comprehensively understood. Substantial proof that purported microbes that are endophytic, epiphytic, or more generally contributing to rhizosphere and phylosphere dynamics externally is necessary to legitimize efficacy. Without evaluating introduced microbes on genetic as well as environmental levels, particularly for their genetic predisposition towards cannabis as a host, there is no guarantee that synergistic relationships will occur at best, and at worst, faculative or obligate pathogens may be introduced unintentionally through natural and artificial inputs. A 400 million year old fact, intimate relationships between land plants and microbes utilize the same and similar avenues of interaction, be they beneficial or detrimental, both because what it means to be beneficial or detrimental changes between genetic and environmental contexts, as does the evolutionary fitness pressure to be one or the other for any set of organisms individually or as a community. Hence, why many endophytic bacteria and fungi that are beneficial or detrimental have ancestral associations to other organisms and as detrivores. The generally additive nature of fitness positive trait genes to the genome means that microbial lineages that predate or developed during the inception of land plants as well as successful arthropod lineages have the ability to interact with both populations more fundamentally, as some of the earliest land colonizers. As it has seemingly happened, the ability to colonize multiple partners, even partners that might not sustain them nutritionally or in certain states, has given rise to microbes that are as successful and long-standing as they are surviving multiple extinction events and fundamentally terraforming the surface of the earth and altering the atmosphere. In close symbioses or other associations with microbes, sometimes the genome is altered or reduced, as the need for conserving the genes associated with certain functions does not negatively affect the fitness of the organism individually or together, at least in certain contexts. Some theories concerning the etiology of certain pathogens, like specific lineages of viruses, speculate that due to the sharing of certain fundamental or integral genes, that certain groups descend partly from the genetic contributions of endosymbiotic cyanobacteria, like plastids such as chloroplasts. It can be said that genetic compatibility plays a fundamental role in the composite multifaceted dynamics between organisms, perhaps better understood 
as meta-organisms, holobionts, or supra-organisms, which are all terms that relate to and account for the interconnected nature of life. Through various contexts, genetic changes have additionally radical ramifications to the effects of these compatibilities. Like the many cultivation contexts that exist, other forms of identification, such as staining and morphological observation, can be useful in the identification process of microbiota, but they are inherently incapable of tracking these genetic cues, as well as the dynamic emergent properties of multiple complex microbial interactions in general and those specific to cannabis, which are even more enigmatic due to a dearth of specific research in this context currently. For these and other salient reasons, microbiological disciplines rely on genetic analyses when studying facets like ecological function, myriad novel or unculturable microbes that exist in the soil, bodies of water, and atmosphere, but are difficult or impossible to study, as well as their taxonomic relationships. Many are unculturable or barely culturable, making their study vastly difficult, especially where concrete understanding of ecological roles are concerned. Through processes like horizontal gene transfer, and what is referred to as natural competence, the genome and subsequently its function in many microbes can change, replicate, and spread very rapidly, even to generally unrelated species, sometimes between entire taxonomic kingdoms, like is the case for the ancient viral arc genes in humans, and ancient fungal carotenoid biosynthesis genes in the P. aphid, Acerthrosiphon pisum, further outmoding the utility of analyses that lack a genetic perspective. In 2018, the aforementioned hemp cultivars Anka, CRS1, and Yvonne were colonized by groups of bacteria and fungi commonly associated with endophytism and rhizosphere presence, with both nitrogen fixing and mycorrhizal symbioses present in such groups. A total of 134 bacterial and 53 fungal strains from leaves, seeds, and petioles were documented. The most abundant bacterial genera were Pseudomonas, Pantoia, and Bacillus, and the most abundant fungal genera were Oreobacidium, Alternaria, and Cochleobolus. Bacteria were found most often in the petioles and most diversely in mid-August, when grown in the research fields of McCrill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. The fungi were found most often in the leaves, and most diversely in late July of the same location. A strain from the genus Oreobacidium contained endohyphal acinetobacter, and five other unculturable bacteria identified to varying degrees were detected. Of those that were detected, several endohyphal molecules, two actinobacteria, a proteobacteria, and a member of the firmicutes were detected in the form of mycoplasma, propionobacterium, acinetobacter, novosphingobium, and staphylococcus. The endophytic fungi containing these endohyphal bacteria might be integrally reliant on them for physiological processes and so understanding comprehensively how endohyphal colonization develops, its mitigation, and possible ramifications would be important for implementation in cultivation contexts. Additionally, rhizobium, a genus of nitrogen-fixing bacteria associated with legumes and perisponia, was also detected in the petioles of hemp cultivars cultivated. In Morocco, several actinobacteria, a group of bacteria which develop hyphal strands similar to fungi and can exist both inside and in close proximity to plants, were associated with the rhizosphere of cannabis plants. These species were Streptomyces coyangensis, Streptomyces actinomycinicus, Streptomyces chartreusis, Streptomyces setoniae, and 
Nocardoides albus, the last of the list being from a genus that is considered rather rare. Lactinobacteria produce many compounds that can have useful antipathogenic plant immune system stimulation and nutrient bioavailability qualities. Already established generally beneficial microbes available for agricultural use can be implemented, especially in the context of pest suppression, though those microbes associated with nutritive supplementation or other substrate dynamics are difficult to quantify for cannabis cultivation specifically. The cannabis soil microbiome has in some research been shown to be affected greatly by cultivar and edaphic composition, where the cultivars Sour Diesel, Buku Kush, Burmese, Maui Waui, and White Widow were investigated in the Vista and Orange counties of California, United States. Microbiome community composition, the diversity of individuals, was primarily influenced by soil type and the properties therein, but the structure of that microbiome community, its number of individual species, was primarily influenced by cultivar. This supports a prevailing concept regarding plant bacteria, fungal, and other microbial ecological interaction, wherein general soil microbial communities in the pedosphere are selected by way of the concentration of rhizodeposits, the exuded plant root cells and related compounds that attract and nourish many soil microbiota. It is from this microbial community that associates with the rhizodeposits in the close proximity of the roots, the rhizosphere and the rhizoplane, that are then selected for through convergent plant host genotype dependent factors as suitable endorhiza, endophytes that can exist in the roots, and in some cases systemically colonize a plant's stem and leaf tissues. Indeed, the cannabis microbiome in the rhizosphere and phylosphere is influenced by cannabis physiology at the molecular and genetic level, making genetic cultivar microbe compatibility a significant factor to account for in cannabis cultivation and the integrated management of pests where such microbes and especially endophytes are concerned. Systemic colonization of plants by microbes can have a wide array of effects, and this includes detrimental pathogens where faculatively pathogenic in certain contexts like with Pseudomonas and Streptomyces species, obligatorily pathogenic in all contexts like with Botrytis scenaria, or generally benign and even beneficial organisms like with many soil-associated entomopathogenic fungi, such as Buveria bassiana. The unique Cannabaceae species Perisponia andersoniae is known to form symbiotic relationships with two genera from the family Rhizobiaceae, Rhizobium and Ensifer, a genus of family Bradyrhizobiaceae, Bradyrhizobium, and a genus from the family Phylobacteraceae, Mesorhizobium. Since the genus Rhizobium has been documented in cannabis, it is possible that Ensifer and other Rhizobiaceae may be compatible with cannabis, but more research is necessary to this end. Many Brady Rhizobiaceae in general and Brady Rhizobium in particular are associated with plants, and mesorhizobium is associated with the roots of plants, such as lotus, which fix nitrogen, befitting a member of the Phylobacteraceae. Viruses are intracellular self-replicating replicons, or entities that can direct their own replication, but require a host in order to do so. Viruses are some of the most numerous infectious agents, and many groups have only recently been discovered, some of which found to be, in fact, exceedingly common. For example, a 50 milliliter sample of marine water can contain as many as 50 million viruses, many of which are bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria. Viruses mutate readily at a rate much more accelerated than the genomes of other organisms. Many have been analyzed and found to be hundreds of millions of years ancient, with many lineages suspected to predate land-plant development 
and others developing at other various points in prehistory. There have been various hypotheses proposed about the etiology of viruses and their evolution, most famously the virus first hypothesis, the reduction hypothesis, and the escape hypothesis. Succinctly, these hypotheses propose that viruses predate life, developed originally from cellular life, or are genetic fragments from cellular life respectively, but none of these alone can explain some of the fundamental structures and traits of viruses. Due to more recent research, much of which published in 2019 regarding the physiology and evolution of early life, propositions like the chimeric origins and co-evolution hypotheses consider these intricacies by proposing that for the former, the parts of viruses important for replication originated primordially but were displaced by cellular host replication parts that diversified over time with more hosts as they evolved, and for the latter, that replicons, genetic information that can self-replicate, existed near resources like primordial hydrothermal vents that produced vesicles in which replicons could exist, and so through evolutionary pressure cells developed from merging with these vesicles. While viruses developed from replicons that simply used such resources, replicated, and found more. Endogenous viral elements are lines of genetic sequences that exist in the germline of cells due to ancient associations, and paleovirological evidence exists of a great many genetic sequences in various higher life forms many of which are from retroviruses which fused part or all of their genome with their host literal ages ago. Of the viruses, there are also viroids, which lack protein coats, making them more so reliant on other viruses and vectors in order to survive and reproduce. They are the smallest infectious agents, sometimes referred to as subviral, and solely infect plants. Although viruses comprise some of the most damaging plant and animal pathogens, several are mutualistic and have been documented to integrate with hosts as well, sometimes through colonizing another endophyte like a fungus or bacteria. The families Hypoviridae, Rayoviridae, and Narnaviridae commonly cause hypovirulence in plant pathogenic fungi. Many have complicated names, such as Botrytis cinerea mitovirus 1, itself a strain of Ophiostoma novo ulmi mitovirus 3b, which infects Botrytis cinerea, the causal agent of gray mold in cannabis and many other plants. Conidia, or asexual spores, as well as hyphae, through anastomosis, can vector hypovirulence, reducing the severity of such infections by decreasing overall reproductive and developmental growth. Mycoviruses can also be beneficial to fungi and plants, having a very close relationship with the Ormia viruses that infect plants, implying that some level of genetic overlap exists between certain plant viruses and mycoviruses. The aptly named Botrytis Ormia-like virus is thought to potentially be a link between mycoviruses that infect fungi and ormaviruses that infect plants, for example. The cannabis virome in particular is poorly studied, but insight from current virological research elucidates these complex interactions across the spectrum of symbiosis, which may aid or impair the cultivation of cannabis both directly and indirectly by influencing the cannabis plant, its mutualistic and parasitic associations, and other factors. Some recent viral and subviral agents confirmed in cannabis as of 2019 include lettuce chlorosis virus, beet curly top virus, cannabis cryptic virus, as well as hop latent viroid, and it is likely more exist and may become adapted. Beneficial microbes and biocontrol agents implemented in a holistic, integrated pest management strategy may become affected positively or negatively by viruses and their environmental dynamics, especially considering their high rate of mutation. 
finding viruses that bolster mutualistic endophytes or biocontrols and impair pathogens and pests of cannabis to this end could lead to the addition of another sophisticated facet of IPM strategy and biosecurity. For these and other reasons, the extremely vast breadth and depth of ecological interactions between plants and microbes should not be underestimated. As cannabis microbiome research advances, these interactions and their nuances will be detected and described, leading to a more adroit application and comprehension of microbiota to achieve a multifaceted holistic cultivation strategy. Microbial biocontrol agents are already available, and more cannabis and pest-targeted microbes backed by research will be implemented as relationships are elucidated. Acknowledging that the integral and reliant relationships between organisms leads to what might be described as a meta-organism made up of biotic and abiotic factors can help with the conceptualization of cannabis and its cultivation as multifaceted and in constant flux. Arthropoda, or what has also been rearticulated recently and more specifically as Cenocondyla, is the exoskeletonized group of animals that encompasses two smaller groups, Mandibulata and Arachnomorpha, at least as they are proposed in some recent research as of 2019, which hail from possibly the Ediacaran period, a minimum of 541 million years ago or so. Some basal arthropods, arguably, and it is contentious, did not have totally arthropodized exoskeletons, and so some tissues were soft and often were not preserved, while others were hard and sometimes easier to analyze, making their study misleading until adequate fossils were found and technologies developed. The Cenocondyla encompasses those organisms that diversified and radiated on land, becoming the insecta, or insects, and arachnida, specifically the acari, or mites, with many macro and microscopic pests of cannabis and other crop plants falling into these two classes generally. Insects and mites come from different beginnings, the mandibulata and arachnomorpha, respectively. Mandibulata contains hexapoda, six-legged organisms, including insecta, insects, with basal ancestors of important pest families like the whiteflies, aphids, and leafhoppers of the order Hemiptera, beetles of Coleoptera, flies of Diptera, moths of Lepidoptera, and thrips of Thysanoptera, developing from at least the Middle Devonian approximately 380 million years ago. In the Emsian or Iphelian age of the Devonian period to approximately 260 million years ago in the Capitanian age of the Permian period. Arachnomorpha contains arachnida, arachnids, including the acari or mites, which further break down into the parasitiformes and the acariformes. The acariformes, or true mites, contains the trombiformes, which a significant portion are the order prostigmata. It is in this order that the three mite families most important to agriculture in general and cannabis in specific as pests exist. The spider mites of Tetranicidae, the thread-footed mites of Tarsanemidae, and the russet mites of Areophyidae, which are thought to have developed between 235 million years ago in the Carnian age of the Triassic period to 180 million years ago in the Torsian age of the Jurassic period. Insects and mites are thought to have descended from originally aquatic, already ecologically specialized exoskeleton-having ancestors, possibly the Megachira. Although a barren and extreme environment with high ultraviolet radiation and low oxygen levels, the surface of land was first colonized by single and then multicellular life, with cyanobacteria having pivotal terrestrialization effects through the Precambrian and Cambrian periods, along with algae and fungi. 
Days were about three hours shorter, and the position of the Earth's moon made tidal forces stronger. Insecta, unlike Crustacea, utilize chitin as a main component of their exoskeleton, as it is lighter and more flexible than the latter's calcium carbonate base. The pterygodes include basically all insects, which can fly or are descended from ancestors who could and the terrestrial or amphibiotic protopterogodes are thought to have developed around 435 million years ago in the Telkian age of the Silurian period, consistent with the thermoregulatory theory that proto-wings were adaptive for heat capture during the colder Silurian period, also a hyperoxic time when there was more oxygen in the atmosphere. This so-called Hemipteroids, or hemiptera-like insects, that would become hemiptera, ancestral to whiteflies, aphids, leafhoppers, as well as the thysanoptera, thrips, are thought to have fed on pollen and fungal spores, in addition to detrivery and a great degree of predation, before a movement to phloem feeding, and may have developed as early as the Guzangian age, 497 million years ago, in the Cambrian period. For the earliest hemiptera, phloem was the predominant preference, and it is the dominant source of nourishment with xylem feeding developing later, with the cicada morpha, in the early Triassic period. Pteridophyta, mostly comprising the polypodiophyta, or ferns today, are known from the Devonian, and it is in that group that a polyploid event whole genome duplication occurred an estimated 319 million years ago in the Bashkirian age of the Carboniferous period, facilitating the diversity of seed-producing spermatophyta estimated to have developed between 368 million years ago in the Feminian age of the Devonian period and 330 million years ago in the Serpukovian age of the Carboniferous period. Hollow metabolism, or complete metamorphosis, developed around 389 million years ago in the Gavetian age of the Devonian period, following their development. The cone producing gymnospermidae descended from a common ancestor diversifying greatly in the Carboniferous period, which started in the Tornasian age. 358 million years ago, and ended in the Gazellian Age, 298 million years ago. The Cycadophyta, Ginkophyta, and Pinophyta developed in this time from ancestral gymnospermidae. Their phytochemical defenses, various metabolites like viscous resins and toxic exudates, defended them against herbivory by insects and other arthropods, and microbial infection. Although in the past it was thought that major plant-associated insect lineages developed with flowering plants, it is actually the earlier cone-producing plants before the end Permian extinction with which these lineages diversified first. Flowering plants, the angiospermidae, are also seed plants that developed from the same ancestor as the cone producers and ancestors are estimated to have started developing at least around the Gavetian age of the Devonian period, approximately 485 million years ago, based on fossil record, continuing into the Anisian age of the Triassic period about 245 million years ago. Much later, in the Berriasian age of the Cretaceous period, 140 million years ago, are fossils known. This is when the so-called core flowering plants, the mesangiospermae, are estimated to have originated, and approximately 10 million years later, in the Houtevian age, are their oldest fossils known so far. It was around this time that bacterial symbioses, like those with nitrogen-fixing bacteria, started to develop in the eudicots particularly leguminosae and cannabaceae, the ancestors of which descend from the rosales. Akari, or mite evolutionary history, has been difficult to evaluate due to their small size and lack of fossil record. Mite phylogeny is complex and certain facets are poorly understood, 
Though some of the agriculturally important groups exist in the Parasitiformes, most are in the group Acariformes, particularly the russet mites of Areophyidae that developed in the Carnian Age of the Triassic period 235 million years ago, closely related to the Nematolicidae, thread-footed mites of Tarsonimidae, related to the Podopolipidae, the spider mites of Tetranicidae, which developed in the Torsian Age before the Gondwana split in the Jurassic period 180 million years ago, and are closely related to the Tanui palpidae, aptly named false spider mites or flat mites. The Acariformes are estimated by some phylogenetic measures to have developed as early as 435 million years ago, in the Telchian age of the Silurian period, following the Ordovician Silurian extinction events due in part to glaciation during the height of adaptation to much warmer conditions aquatically and terrestrially. The most commonly encountered spider mite in agriculture, including cannabis, is the neotropic and afrotropic originating Tetranicus urticae, the two-spotted spider mite, and this is because of its genomic plasticity, making it extremely adept at processing xenobiotic compounds that might be hazardous. More than any other animal, Tetranicus urticae has been documented to have 80 UGT genes, some of which associated with the Actinobacteria streptomyces violasis niger and chloroflexi, which were transferred through a horizontal gene transfer event and are speculated to help in the metabolism of toxic compounds of so many plant hosts, possibly through glycolization, which is a common method of bacterial metabolization. One of the most common biocontrol agents for the two-spotted spider mite is Phytostilius persimilis, a member of the family Phytoceidae, tribe Phytoceulini, and considered a type 1a specialist of Tetranicus species. The Tarsonemidae phylogeny is not well known, but most species can only feed on more primitive land plants. Anomalously, Polyphagotarsonemus latus, the broad mite, feeds on a wide range of more modern plants, including cannabis, through feeding adaptation in part due to its phytotoxic saliva. Similarly, most Areophyidae are not lethal for their host plants and are highly host-specific, but some do vector pathogens and induce physical change in plants, with cannabis having its own specialist, the hemp russet mite Aculops cannabicola. About 20 million years after the Cambrian Ordovician extinction event and late Ordovician glaciation, 40 million years after the Dresbachian extinction event and 50 million years after the N. Photomian mass extinction event, the earliest of group insecta, in particular, are thought to have developed in the Darwinian stage of the Ordovician period, approximately. 460 million years ago, based on some recent phylogenetic estimations, but the oldest fossil record only reaches to 400 million years ago in the Devonian period's Pragian stage. The Ordovician time period in general is a tumultuous biogeographical time, and it is known for the Ordovician radiation, sometimes referred to as the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event in which the previous Cambrian radiation of animals and success of other complex multicellular organisms solidified, especially in marine environments. The Darwinian age closely follows after the Ordovician meteor event, estimated to have happened 467 million years ago, when L-type chondrite meteors made sustained, concentrated impact in what is now the North American and West Eurasian continents, ejected from an impact that occurred in the flora family of Silesius type asteroids. One of the proposed sources for the meteor which caused the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event much later. Insects were the first animals to develop winged flight, and this trait was and is critical for their ecological success, making the winged insects, known as pterogoda, a group that includes the vast majority of insects in existence, with three main classifications that follow. 
straight-winged insects, the old-winged Paleoptera, those that can flex or fold their wings straight alongside their body, the more numerous new-winged Neoptera, and the also significant Paranoptera, which rest their wings along their body. Exactly how these groups relate is not understood totally. These wing morphologies do not represent a true basis for relatedness, but it is accepted that this wing-based evolution was paramount. Of the Neoptera, there are the Endopterygoda, or inner wing havers, also referred to as the Holometabola, which metamorphize through distinctive larva, pupa, and adult life stages, such as Coleoptera, Neuroptera, Hymenoptera, and Lepidoptera, as well as the Exopterygoda, outer wing havers, or Hemimetabola, which develop through successive nymphal stages terminating as adults, such as the Orthoptera, Hemiptera, Blatodia, and Dermaptera. The first insects probably developed from freshwater Pancrustacea ancestors multiple times, and water-associated Holometabolus insects, those that develop amphibiously and require aquatic spaces to complete their life cycle, were some of the first. The 60 million year time scale known as the Carboniferous period from 358 million years ago to 298 million years ago was an especially important time for insect evolution and radiation due to its higher oxygen and temperature levels. Some of the earliest fossil evidence for certain winged insects such as the Protothoptera that predated the current grasshopper group Orthoptera is dated to the late Serpukovian stage of the Carboniferous period 330 to 323 million years ago, with their grasshopper-like mouthparts existing as some of the earliest and implied an omnivorous diet. Paleoptera, like primitive lace wings of Neuroptera, are also known from this period. The dragonflies of Odonata are developmentally amphibious, and fossil record supports the existence of loosely similar organisms in the Carboniferous called the Odonatoidea, and included the largest flying arthropods to ever exist, the griffinflies, dated to the Bashkirian age of the Carboniferous period 315 to 323 million years ago. Of these, the largest, Meganeuropsis, had a wing length of 33 centimeters, wingspan of 71 centimeters, length of 43 centimeters, and existed later in the Artinskian age of the Permian period, 283 to 290 million years ago. Ancient rochoids, protococroaches, collectively called Blatoptera, were also very common in the early Devonian and Carboniferous insect record, and are thought to have diversified into modern cockroaches, termites, and mantids, as well as possibly other groups like Hemiptera, though Socodia is considered the most ancient fossil-supported Hemipteroid, or Hemiptera-like insect. In the very late Carboniferous period, 315 million years ago, in the Moscovian age, Another extinction event called the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse occurred, wherein the equatorial forests of supercontinent Euramerica fragmented, and both oxygen and temperature levels lowered, radically affecting arthropod development, with a reduction in size being most prominent. Lineages that survived the Permian-Triassic extinction event 252 million years ago encompass most of the extant lineages observable today, with close to 60% of insect families estimated to have become extinct due to methanogenic microbes, meteor impact, and volcanism affecting change in the global climate, subsequently influencing the primary food source of many insects, which were plants, particularly cone-producing gymnosperms. Around the Anisian age of the Triassic period, Flowering plants diverge from cone-producing plants, and this diversification profoundly influenced the evolution of insects, especially pest hemiptera, such as the whiteflies, aphids, and scale insects of Sternorinca, 
and the plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, spittle bugs, and cicadas, Ocinorinca, as well as the thrips of Thysanoptera, which are phylogenetically related. Modern species of Sternorinca, Ocinorinca, and Thysanoptera compose most of the Paraneoptera, and these groups account for most vectors of the phytopathogenic microbes that have been documented, several of which are documented cannabis pests that transmit such pathogens. The basal lineages of Paraneoptera fed on microbial mats, and this older feeding behavior may be how such phytopathogenic and endosymbiotic microbes were first recruited and conserved in this lineage. The first flies of Diptera are thought to have developed approximately 240 million years ago in the Ladinian age of the Triassic period, with older groups like the gnats of Bibionomorpha and mosquitoes of the Calicomorpha encompassing the Nematocera, younger groups developing later, such as the hoverflies of Syrphidae, and much more recently, those encompassing in the group Schizophora, such as the peacock flies of Tephritidae and the fruit flies of Drosophilidae. The next 140 or so million years of evolution throughout the Jurassic and Cretaceous were influential, in part because insectivory by vertebrates like birds developed, and biogeographic distribution through continental movement occurred in much of the Cretaceous. Some flowering plant lineages are actually known from the Jurassic. Fossilized Lepidoptera, moths, and butterflies are known from the Eocene epoch of the Paleogene period, between 56 and 33 million years ago or so, but they may have originated in the Cretaceous before much continental shift according to some research based on their global distribution and their close association with flowering plants particularly, which developed at that time. Insects have formed important and ancient beneficial symbioses with various microbial life like viruses, fungi, and especially bacteria, particularly as endosymbionts, such as is the case with most hemiptera. The volatile molecules produced by many bacteria particularly play a primary role in the chemical communication of insects. From a physical chemistry perspective, there are many similarities, including high vapor pressure, low molecular mass, low boiling point, and low polarity, and produced from very different biosynthetic pathways. Several extinction events occurred around the Ordovician period, which may have had an effect on early insect evolution. Intra-kingdom communication between animalia, specifically arthropoda, nematoda, plantae, bacteria, fungi, and other microbiota exists in many forms among myriad contexts, with chemical-based communication agents, so-called semiochemicals, playing many direct and indirect roles. The microbiome of an organism plays important roles in biotransformation of compounds, like semiochemicals, which may be toxic or beneficial to certain other organisms. These compounds interact with the host and associate organisms in profound and fundamental ways. This meta-organism, collectively the organism and closely associated organisms, relies on this complex community to adapt and overcome environmental challenges. From a holistic IPM perspective, this communication nexus is relevant to synergistic maintenance of pest pressure, biocontrol agents, plant immune response, and other facets, in much the same way that it is ecologically relevant. For an example, relevant to many crops, including some of the most pernicious cannabis pests, intraspecies semiochemicals are present in aphid honeydew, including E beta farnesine and other bacterial volatile organic compounds. E-beta-farnesine is an alarm pheromone for some aphids. Bacterial and fungal volatile organic compounds can influence behaviors like aggregation and separation, aggression and docility, oviposition, sexual attraction, repulsion, viability, and many related to sociality, as well as physiological processes directly. Soil microbes can facilitate certain microbial and 
arthropodal relationships, both beneficial and detrimental to plants, both directly and indirectly, through increasing the uptake of resources they might utilize. A typical example is the way nitrogen-fixing bacteria and nitrogen-facilitating mycorrhizas result in more nitrogenous sap, which in turn facilitates the growth and reproduction of many aphid species. The terpenes, phenols, alcohols, esters, and ketones, and other phytochemicals in the structures of plants, like those in cannabis trichomes, can be broadly toxic and physically hazardous for susceptible organisms that are exposed to them. Some arthropods have symbionts that reduce their toxicity or even incorporate them into their physiology for defense, which in such a case might increase its attractiveness through evolutionary selection pressures. Many bacterial symbionts that have these functions are proteobacteria or molecules of the same genera as beneficial and detrimental endophytes. Another example of a tripartite microbe-insect-plant symbiosis mediated by semiochemicals regards a model aphid species, the P. aphid, Acerthrocyphum pisum, Staphylococcus scurri, and Staphylococcus xylosis, live in honeydew produced by the P. aphid, and mediate mutualistic interaction with Lazius niger, the black garden ant. The bacteria produce attractants, including limonene, butanoic acid, isoamyl alcohol, isovaleraldehyde, isovaleric acid, diacetyl, propanone propane, and various alkyl pyrazines that incentivize their presence as guards to deter predators of the P. aphid. Staphylococcus scurri and Acinobacter calcoacidicus also produce betanoic acid and other compounds in honeydew that are attractants and ovipositional stimulants for, for example, Epicirphus baltiatus, a hoverfly that is a natural biocontrol agent of the P. aphid, described in some literature as the most efficient, abundant, and highly specialized epiphytophagus predators. Honeydew is also a substrate for non-pathogenic epiphytic city molds in the order Capnodiales and rhizospheres in general and beneficial microbes in particular that facilitate the uptake and assimilation of nitrogen in plant sap which directly facilitates the reproduction of aphids and production of honeydew which attracts both detrimental and beneficial organisms associated with aphids making the presence of honeydew more ecologically complex than previously recognized or appreciated. Based on the current understanding of cannabis evolutionary history and the nature of recent host-pest relationship models and hypotheses for invasive success of plants and animals, some speculation can be made about the dynamic. In research concerning conifers, species that diverged between 10 and 30 million years or so are predicted to be at risk for sharing herbivorous sap-feeding insects as potential pests. For conifer species that diverged between 1 and 1.5 million years ago, there is a risk of sharing potential pestiferous bees, wasps, and ants. This research is some of the first of its kind to confirm certain hypotheses about pest-host relationships and may be of use in predicting potential pests in cannabis presently and more precisely in the future. Additionally, some assert that Central Eurasia may be the origin of Angiospermae, the entire flowering plant group, or at least close, but this is not definitive. The enemy release hypothesis is one of several that explains how some plants and other organisms are particularly effective at colonizing new habitats in certain contexts. On introduction to a new region, species experience a decrease in regulation by herbivores, infectious agents, and other natural enemies, resulting in a rapid increase in distribution and abundance. The endophyte enemy release hypothesis expands on this premise, explaining that there is a propensity for microbes to exist inside plants, especially those that confer physiological benefits. 
in some cases, there are developmental trade-offs that make sense when under the stresses of natural enemies because their presence is a net positive and overall improve population survival. When introduced to a new environment, these microbes can allow some species to better adapt, especially if they are free from native enemies. Additionally, a plant population that normally benefits from these native microbes due to their mitigation of various stressors might be separated from the microbes and any benefits or costs associated with them when transported to a new environment. Without natural enemies, such populations might flourish due to both the lack of enemy pressure and the defense costs associated with endophytes. If they are free of costly symbioses, crop and other plant species can grow more vigorously in certain circumstances, unhindered by some of the defense costs for pest pressures. Likewise, the development of both cultivated and wild plant populations may be influenced through the colonization of certain endophytes, which may be more prevalent in the native ranges of various plant species. The novel weapons hypothesis suggests that colonization success is sometimes attributable to competitive, defensive, and predatory traits. Traits developed for defense in a given community of organisms, both plants and their symbiotic partners, can appear and subsequently disappear when pressures are reduced and low enough to not select for them over a period of time. The evolution of increased competitive ability hypothesis accounts for the tendency for escape from enemy pressures to cause a reallocation of physiological resources from defense to growth and other competitive traits. All these hypotheses have important implications for plant cultivation and the integration of pest management techniques, especially at the interface between environment, biocontrol agent, target pest, and plant physiology. Considering these ecological assertions and the observed patterns on which they are based, integrated pest management of cannabis might sample for speculative pests, the biocontrol organisms for those pests, and beneficial microbes from the lower, middle, and upper latitudes of eastern Eurasia, encompassing areas of what is now the People's Republic of China, the Republic of India, and other biomes associated with wild and cultivated cannabis populations in the Eurasian continent. Historic sites of cultivation, both ancient and contemporary, and surrounding areas can be useful for investigating pest populations that may still reside natively or exotically, transported by human cultivation methodology. Such sites may be important concentration points for both genetic development of cultivated cannabis, as well as pests which may have been drawn to and subsequently adapted to cultivated cannabis environments in various biomes. Additionally, although perhaps not directly generalizable, Due to the difference in physiology between cannabis and conifers, if we applied the same previously mentioned model, potential pests might be found from closely related genera in the same family as cannabis, such as hops in the genus Humulus and hackberries in the genus Celtus. Both hops and hackberries are cultivated and propagated by humans, making them a potential vector, based on some models. More loosely, Generalist pests that feed on Cannabaceae, Moraceae, or Urticaceae may have adapted to more fundamental immune system developments shared by these related families. Cultivation targeting certain qualities in cannabis can radically change the susceptibility status of cannabis populations, as the selection for genes related to certain traits can simultaneously select against resistance genes and protein families that defend against pests and pathogens directly and indirectly. As is typical for many cultivated plants, wild populations can contain dramatically increased resistance factors compared to cultivated populations, and feral populations that have escaped cultivation selection, as well as land-raised populations associated with certain geographic areas, represent a reservoir for gene-based resistance traits to both biotic and abiotic stressors. Unbeknownst to the earliest cannabis cultivators, 
selections for certain traits also selected against others, which may not have been recognizable, but still detrimental, such as pest resistance and microbial compatibility. An example of closely related plant speciation relating to pest specialization for Cannabaceae may be represented by Forodon cannabis, the cannabis aphid, and Forodon humulus, the hop aphid. Both aphids are from the same genus in the tribe Macrosophini, subfamily Aphidinae, and descendants from a common ancestor that may have followed both the geographic expansion of cannabis and for the hop aphid, hop, and alternative prunus genus stone fruit hosts. Some hypotheses about aphid evolutionary development posit that the subfamily Aphidinae developed between 80 and 150 million years ago between the late Jurassic, the late Cretaceous periods, and may have quickly radiated 43 to 66 million years ago in the Paleogene period, around the time aphids were moving from conifers to flowering plants and a crucial period in which the cannabis forerunner genus Aphananthae developed. In the speculation of macroscopic pests like insects and mites, as well as microscopic pests like fungi, bacteria, water molds, and viruses, already documented feeding and infection events are crucial to understanding the current pest pressure globally. It should be noted that most pests of cannabis are not specialists of the genus, and several are generalists with a very wide host range, with many considered native to Eurasia. This wide host range confers two main advantages, rapid expansion across suitable host plants, and a physiology sophisticated in mitigating many general and unique plant immune defenses. Of course, based on previously mentioned information, the ability for pests to colonize plant populations effectively can be greatly influenced by the presence or absence of various microbes and natural enemies. The ecological composition of the local area greatly influences pest pressure as, for example, the prevalence of alternative hosts allow pests to colonize and expand their population, while a lack of such hosts will disable their expansion and nearby establishment. Similarly, through a process referred to as dilution, a sufficiently large proportion of diverse, non-host plants can diffuse exotic pest populations and curtail their establishment in natural ecosystems, though at lower proportions and levels of diversity, pest populations can be promoted by providing niches through a process called facilitation. In a cultivation space, these and related phenomena can be manipulated in order to facilitate cannabis production and impair pest establishment. The culling of unnecessary plant life is useful to deny pest populations alternative hosts in or near the cultivation space, but alternatively, certain plants can be intentionally established en masse to dilute incoming pests for which they are unsuitable hosts, as well as attract potential parasites and predators of said pests that are already present in the greater cultivation area. Susceptible plants are intentionally planted around cultivated plants and checked regularly to detect pest populations in the area early. Strategically, at the national and international level, pest risk analyses assess the likelihood of pest invasion. Plant cultivation and the trade of produce and ornamental plants is one of the most common avenues for pest dispersal, and these analyses are often limited by our knowledge about what pests actually exist at and along trade routes. For this reason, commodity risk analyses are implemented. In one study, sentinel plants were planted in Beijing and Fuyang, China in order to document potential pests and their movement into other locations. At each site, 105 insect species and host associations were found on sentinel plants, and 90% of these associations had not been found in a previous literature survey of insect pests of the five plant species utilized. Nearly 80% of these associations were not found in a a posteriori literature survey. These subsequent assessments classified 9%, 7%, and 
and 84% of the insect records as presenting a high, moderate, and low likelihood of introduction, respectively. These results show the benefit of whole sentinel nurseries to identify potential infestation of plant commodity imports. Similar strategies are used at lower scales, but the concept is the same. Detect potential pests before they become problematic. In addition to this directive, important observations should ideally be shared with organizations dedicated to the recording of such information and development of defensive measures in the face of concerning population data. To do so at the cultivation level, cultivators must be familiar with the organisms normally encountered in their area as pests. In this case, pests of cannabis and regularly assess pest pressure inside and outside of the crop as part of a crop scouting procedure. Regional and international support exists for the documentation of cannabis pests in particular. However, due to various factors, the extent of pests known on cannabis, particularly microscopic pests like fungi, bacteria, water molds, and viruses, are poorly documented and researched. The implementation of established and improved strategies for documentation by cultivators, supplemented by pest-related research programs, is of paramount importance as cultivation of cannabis continues across the world, especially in regions of Eurasia, where wild populations and cultivated populations developed and still exist. There is a concept called phylosymbiosis, and refers to the ecological relatedness of the microbiome of an organism and its relationship to the evolution of the organism itself. It explains a pattern whereby microbiome communities are unique, to related groups of organisms, and while distinguishable between species, increase in relatedness as species increase in relatedness and vice versa. The microbiome of two species in the same genus will be more similar than two species in different genera, families, and orders. It is also the case that this relationship is functional. The microbiome of the organism in which it associates affects that organism's performance. One of the factors that regulates this relationship is the host's immune system, as the production of antimicrobial compounds necessarily limit and select for microbes that can mitigate exposure. The microbial endophytes found in genera closely related to cannabis, such as humulus, celtis, and perisponia, may be similar and potentially interact in similar ways. Aphids are some of the oldest plant herbivores, and their evolution follows a similar influence, being closely associated with the evolution of their hosts, from cone-producing plants to flowering plants, with various groups developing and adaptively radiating as their hosts did, such as the aphidini have with the rosales, specifically the rosaceae, as some species are nigh identical physically and genetically but show clear delineation for host plant preference, and hybrids of populations and close related species complexes perform poorly on the host plants of their parents. Conceptually, there seems to be an importance of association in ecology spatiotemporally. Association spatially and temporally can yield more sophisticated interactions. From the earliest bacterial, fungal, botanical, and animal life, and their environment to contemporary present. From various and highly divergent lineages such as these, composite organisms such as lichen or the cyanobacterial origins of the chloroplast make up or fundamentally influenced species from different lineages that have existed since before the beginning of life on the surface of Earth. And those symbioses, whether commensalic, mutualistic, parasitic, or another, continue to change over space and time, making up the interactions of Earth's holobiome, interfacing genetically through the massive hologenome, all the genomes of all the organisms on Earth, communicating through all the facets of life possible born from these ultimately genetic influences. This is relevant to cannabis cultivation because human influence has intensified this spatial and temporal ecological coevolutionary dynamic 
through domestication, selective breeding, and cultivating populations in close proximity, giving rise to various cultivars and having emergent ecological properties on wild populations directly and indirectly affected by human agriculture. Anthropogenic, globalized transport has severely reduced spatial isolation and in very short time. Though many organisms are capable of so-called long-distance distribution, success was rarer than through anthropogenic means. From this holistic perspective, the integrated management of cannabis pests must consider the etiology of pests as well as the host. How did they develop, both independently and in proximity, and for how long, if at all? What factors, both biotic and abiotic, mediate and influence this interaction, and at what level? This context is useful, because it can significantly inform how the pest is problematic accurately and precisely, but also succinctly, and the development of solutions is facilitated with these fundamental questions answered, though they may require research, especially for those that are unique or novel. Through both direct and indirect interactions, organisms perceived as pestiferous, or beneficial, can influence the genetic expression of cannabis both as individual plants or at the population level, and the holobiome of cannabis, its genome as well as all the associated genomes of organisms on, around, and inside it, make up a sort of supraorganism, a meta-association that can significantly alter the development of the plant and its constituents, including its arrestment as well as its facilitation.